the whole sector has sort of lifted up again of investors going, oh, well, we thought it was going to be really bad. In fact, it's we're kind of muddling through. And so there's been a heap of opportunities as this sort of reflation is happening. If you're listening to this and you're, you're interested in small caps or what you think you should be is what kind of is get on board. I think we've just talked about how there's been a little rally for three or four months. I think the market can run for, for several years. And with things improving, the, the, the clock has gone in, sort of gone past the, the crash phase, if you like, where you can start to dig around and go, hey, there's some really cheap projects here that are 50% down on what they were before. And that's especially true of the gold sector. It's Australia's biggest export. It's the most profitable sector of the ASX. Um, and yet people don't really follow it anymore. There's no narrative attached to it. They just assume that it's kind of like there and that China will eventually fall over and the price will go back to the long-term average of $50 or something. But what sticks out for me is that the iron ore price doesn't do that. I'm Shay Russell and welcome back to Cocktails and Commodities, the resource podcast where macro analysis meets mining insights. Make sure you tap the like button so you never miss out on what guest I have on next. And please remember all information in today's podcast is general in nature. We're going to double down on that warning today. My guest discusses some of the shares that he has recommended over the past or personally invested in. So I just want to reconfirm that today's Stocks that are mentioned should not be considered financial advice, and they're just reflecting my guest's experience. All right, let's get on with it. And joining me today in the studio is our former colleague, a good friend, Callum Newman. Hang on, let me read this out. He's Fat Tail Investment Researchers Small Cap Specialists. That's me, yes, absolutely. There's too many S's in that for somebody <laughs> with a lisp. <laughs> How are you? I'm very well, very glad to be here with you. Mate, it has been far too long in between drinks and in between catch-ups. And in fact, our pre-chat lasted 25 minutes when it's normally only supposed to last five minutes. Absolutely. Which is why we're having lunch after today's podcast so we can catch up properly. Now, Callum, we have a lot of shit to cover in a short uh, space of time. So first of all, why are you here? Why would I want to invite somebody like you onto my podcast? Essentially what I'm asking is, even I know your credentials, but can you tell everybody listening what they are? Absolutely. So I work with a publisher called Fat Tail Investment Research. So we're uh, independent and we uh, cover off on different areas of the market. So we have different editors. One guy does gold. We have a general resource uh, man who's a former geologist, uh, got the deep value guy, that kind of thing. But I, I do the uh, small cap sector. So the little companies, uh, we were talking about this before. So anywhere from uh, it's like probably 100 million up to about... Uh, 800 million usually, but sometimes I go a little bit bigger depending on uh, uh, the opportunity and how the market's going. So I've been doing that for a long time. I've been a fat tail for 12 years now, which is uh, incredible. So I've seen a few cycles and all that type of thing. And um, I'm very pumped for, for what's happening now. Yes. So you've outdone my tenure with uh, Fat Tail. I was there for 11 years and I didn't think anybody could beat me. Now, I want to touch on something that you did say off camera for everybody listening. Now, you mentioned that uh, some of your companies go from $100 million to $800 million or some of your recommendations that fall into that band. But you said that you're willing to stretch it out to $2 billion when the time is right. And now, in my mind, $2 billion uh, is not a small cap. So why would you be recommending a stock that has such a large valuation and consider it a small cap? Well, I've got two services, right? So I have Australian Small Cap Investigator, which is um, what I would call an investment service. So we're looking for stocks where you can buy them today on the expectation you'll hold them for one year, two years, three years, go with them as they grow kind of thing. So those those are the ones where the, in that range up to about a billion type thing. The bigger ones, I have a second service, which is an algo-driven service where we're looking to trade the small cap uh, market. The bigger stocks bring you more liquidity. So because I'm not trading by myself, I'm, I'm bringing the guys with me. Obviously, we need to be able to get in and out. So the more turnover, the more volume, it's easier to get in at, at, at a, a price without moving the stock itself. Um, and I found as a function of the, the recent market, and we should talk about this. So the small caps have been in a pretty rough patch for the last two years until the last, uh, say, four or five months. Um, before, previous there, it's been quite difficult. So the bigger stocks, um, the ones with the earnings. So not, for your listeners, not every company on the ASX is profitable. Some don't even have revenue, as you know, <laughs> uh, especially in your sector. So <laughs> yes. the 
my observation uh, of the recent market is as money has flowed to companies with earnings, and that's been true for, for quite a while. So that has, you sort of got to go with the flow sometimes in the market and, and, and find those companies that the market likes and, and go with that. Um, but the, there will come a time when those companies that are pre-revenue and what have you have their day in the sun as well. So you, you sort of shift with the wind, as it were. Um, I like, you've actually taken me exactly where I want to go next, and that is talking about small caps, because for a long time, they sucked. Now, the resource sector is still struggling a bit. Oh, there's some good opportunities in there performing well, but uh, small caps sucked in general for a long period of time, and sentiment was in the toilet. And as you rightly pointed out, there's been a bit of a bounce in the past four to five months. Now, tell me, how does this bounce match up with the broader investment sentiment that I'm seeing in headlines? Because in headlines, it's all very dreary. Oh, it's a recession. Oh, Australia's in the toilet. But if small caps have seen a bounce, that suggests to me otherwise. Well, I could go on for a long time about this. So Go uh, for it. We've got 25 minutes to fill. (laughs) That's really interesting. So go back to August 2021. Oh, okay. Are you sure it's 25 minutes? Um, (laughs) At that time, the Chinese property market came to the fore with its difficulties and the developers going broke and that type of thing. It was around about that time that the small caps really started to weaken. So I could, you couldn't see headlines about it, but I could see it in the price action, right? So you'd have a company come out with a good update. It just wouldn't rise, so, and they were starting to sell down. So it became apparent to me that the market was getting into trouble and that the small caps were, were going down first. And later on, about mid-22, we saw finally the, the whole market break, right? But the small caps had already crashed. They stayed down for far longer than I anticipated. So the whole narrative of the US going into recession, rising rates, the fear around the property market. Um, we had the story about the mortgage cliff for a while where you know all of the borrowers were going to revert up after their fixed own lend and that was going to crush the economy. So the whole sector just got absolutely dumped. And it, Murray, one of the guys I trade with, you know, all through 2023 were like, it just wouldn't move. It was extremely difficult to find anything that showed a bit of life. Um, uh, oddly enough, I did a speech uh, around the in November for the Fat Tail guys, and I, at that point, I was saying, "Guys, you have just a, an amazing opportunity to to buy up this stuff. So much bad news has been smashed into them that it only takes things to get you know less bad in uh, sort of quotation marks, and they'll start rising." Now, I had seen this before when we worked together in 2018, the small caps went through a similar slump and the market got hammered around that time as well. (laughs) And I remember there was a particular stock that I told my guys about, um, what's its name? Uh, Stephen Dash. Its name has dropped out of my head. It will come to me. But anyway, I was really excited for it. It was grinding along and I could not understand at the time, you know, what was holding it back. And then it was like flicking a switch. Suddenly it just ripped up as the market sort of appreciated what it was uh, what it was doing. And eventually it got a takeover offer from Rupert Murdoch. Credible Labs, that was the stock. Ah, oh, yes, Labs. okay. Uh, now, Stephen Dash went on to make, you know, tens of millions of dollars. Uh, and I, I remember telling my guys, I said, like, this thing can turn on a dime once the market gets over its fear. And in that speech, I gave six stocks. And we look back now, I mean, it sounds obvious now, but at the time, you know, the market had gone down for three months into into that November period. Very grim, rates were rising, all that type of thing. Those six stocks have since all gone up really strongly. So, and we've seen it in the retailers actually in the last few months, uh, or last yeah since January. Uh, they're coming out with results that are down on the prior cut, but the the shares are rallying because the market's pleased that they're not worse. That the results. Are- <laughs> are actually okay. Like Maya had flat sales, right? But it's it's better than 20%. So it's the less bad narrative. It's a less bad narrative. So the whole sector has sort of lifted up again of investors going, oh, well, we thought it was going to be really bad. In fact, it's we're kind of muddling through. And so there's been a heap of opportunities um, as, that, as this sort of reflation is happening. And it's really interesting to me because there's a book that I really like by a guy called Colin Nicholson. Uh, and he wrote it in 2008. And he, he put what he called a, a bull market into three stages. And he called the first one reviving confidence. And so I sort of framed that to my guys at the same time. I said, again, once the market gets over its fear and uh, things will, will start to heat up again. And thus far, that little game plan he put down in that book, which is now almost 15 years old kind of thing, 
is working. Okay, so let's take your small cap things and now apply it to what you look at because you're agnostic to what companies are actually the sector that they're working in. Because I know when I first approached you to do a podcast a few months ago, you're like, oh, I'm not really into resources. I'm really not. And then a lot's changed in a couple of months. Now, suddenly you are considering certain stocks in the resource sector. So what made that position of yours flip to be like, yeah, look, I'm looking over here at certain small caps that there are really good opportunities presenting themselves in resources? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess like the market's cyclical and each sector and each little subdivision is cyclical. So things go from being undervalued to overvalued type of thing. So I mentioned the retailers there. So we caught uh, one of those uh, in Australian small cap investigator, Beacon, kind of Beacon Lighting, got a good little rise out of that one. But at some point that gets fully priced in and it can only grow so far. So it's not, it's not the type of stock that can keep shooting up. Now, I remember we have a mutual mate, uh, Headley Widdop, who runs the uh, Lion Group, and they are famous for their clock, the Lion Clock. So I remember last year, you know, we were shooting the breeze about that, and it, and at that stage, the lithium narrative and the, the electric car narrative was still was still running. But he was warning people, saying, "Look, the mining cycle is driven by liquidity, and the the juniors have to go through a down phase, basically." And so I relayed that to my guys. So I sort of stepped aside from the resource sector, waiting for the clock to to go through its various phases, right? And of course, overlaid on this is the bear market, general bear market in both the small cap sector and the ASX, right? So that kind of high risk uh, area is always going to get crushed while people are scared and they don't want to put their money on the line and that type of thing. But now again, with things improving, the, the clock has gone in, sort of gone past the, the crash phase, if you like, where you can start to dig around and go, hey, there's some really cheap projects here that are 50% down on what they were before. And that's especially true of the gold sector. And so what makes gold so interesting is that the stocks have been crushed, but at the same time, gold in Aussie dollars is at record highs. And we now we have, as we were recording today, the US gold price breaking out. And there's very, very good reasons to think that gold's going to go higher. So Again, you put that sort of puzzle together and you go, well, maybe it's time to start looking at some uh, gold names. Well, so I wasn't going to go to gold, but you mentioned it and that's one of my well, favorite. You love it. Yeah, it's one of my favorite metals. So let's talk about gold. So you decided to pivot into gold. Like, let's be honest, like, I think there's still some investors are still struggling to embrace the idea that gold has found a new bottom at $2,000 per ounce. I would say that bottom is firmly in and it would take a significant event to break that. But you've taken a pivot towards gold long before we could say that bottom was established. So this is about towards the end of last year. What opportunities are you seeing in the gold sector right now? Are you looking at producers, developers, or do you think explorers are where the real opportunity is? Well, let me go back and give you a little bit of history. So I love how every question you've gone to answer with is, let me go back and go well, to the This history. is what it happens <laughs> when you've been around a long time, all right? Um, <laughs> oh, no, no, keep going. I love so, it. So in November 22, I wrote a book called Condomania, which was a, the idea that the Western economies, are, they're too indebted and the, the central banks, even though they were talking tough on inflation and, and rates and something, don't, uh, over a five-year period, have to subsidize their governments, right? So they have to monetize the debt. And I pointed out in that document that China was, was weak and was going to stay weak because it's getting old and it's got all sorts of internal problems and that's been a big growth driver for the, for the world economy. And at that stage, the... As you well know, gold had peaked out, or the gold socks had peaked out, and had gone down for a l over a year, possibly two by by that November twenty two period. Uh, again, a similar situation. So you have all these cheap gold stocks and uh, reasons to be bullish gold. So at that stage, with Squandermania, I tipped Bellevue Gold, which was in that kind of classic uh, Lasson curve period where it was to, it wasn't in production, but it was going to be moving into it and that's the period the market usually marks up the stock kind of thing anyway we got a ripping run on that bellevue gold uh like in five months it was up 60 percent. so i said look guys you had a quick quick win just bank it you know yeah in hindsight they could have held on and count your lucky stars in this market yeah, yeah. absolutely you got to be careful with the the mining stuff because it can go against you i don't want to make it sound like i can't pick a dud <laughs> um and then with the the small cap uh, systems with the algo driven one we we got a bit of a ride in a company called spartan resources last year so um there are so there have been pockets of opportunity in the gold stocks but it, as a general rule the the junior sectors so the explorers and the developers have been crushed 
and the the bigger producers have held up okay because they've got the cash flow. Um, so I tend to see the opportunity in the in the ones that are down more, so the explorers and the developers. Well, depending on, of course, depending on the gold price, right? If if the big ones start to run, well, I might jump on board as a trade. But in terms of like buying and holding, I'd, I'd look to the smaller ones. I want to touch on your recent interest in iron ore. Now, a lot of there's a lot of hope, a trading hope around the idea that China is going to throw massive amounts of stimulus at the economy like we have seen in the past. And it just still hasn't happened yet. Like there is, in my view, there is no big bang coming. However, I'm wondering if you've taken a different view because you've recently reckon, recommended a couple of iron ore stocks. Please don't name any current recommendations, by the way, um, just for any regulators listening to this conversation today. Um, what made you pick iron ore? Because essentially I, the iron ore price has fallen from, what, 145 US dollars per tonne to a bit under around 115 US dollars per tonne. Why would you suddenly be bullish on iron ore? Well, hang on. I'll have to back you up there a little bit. I did have a crack with a couple of recommendations. I've since cut them. Oh, okay. But I do follow the iron ore story. Um, well, tell me, is it any good news in there? Look, look, I've got to go back again. Okay, good. So okay. I, I started following iron ore for, for the last four or five years, right? Because actually I find it curious that investors, speculators, punters, Everybody loves the narrative, right? So it was heavily dominated by lithium and uh, electric vehicles, and now we have uranium running and this type of thing. So why is iron ore curious? Well, oddly enough, it's Australia's biggest export. It's the most profitable sector of the ASX, um, and yet people don't really follow it anymore. There's no narrative attached to it. They just assume that it's kind of like there and that China will eventually fall over and the price will go back to the long-term average of $50 or something. But what sticks out for me is that the iron ore price doesn't do that. It's still over $100 US, right? So it's very, very profitable. So if I'm going to do a trade, for example, and I enter an iron ore stock, I'm talking about the bigger ones here yeah, more so, but I know that they're minting money, right? So if I see a reason to be bullish on iron ore, I know that I'm getting a look at a very secure kind of stock because they just make so much money. So the reason I bring that up is last year, around about, October, September, I can't remember exactly. I wrote a, a piece or two for Livewire to say that actually you should be bullish iron ore because it's not as bad as everybody thinks. Um, and I can tell you what led to that, but China was basically stimulating her, mar her markets, right? That takes up the price of iron ore. Now, I love that situation where you have everybody thinking iron ore is going to go down and you have every reason to think it's going to go up, right? Now, in the end, I fluffed the trade because I bought BHP in that instance. I should have bought Fortescue. Fortescue <laughs> went up 40%. And what scared me off was all their stuff, their green and hydrogen stuff. I'm like, they're losing focus-wise and all the staff are leaving. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on there, but it doesn't look good. Should have bought Fortescue. But anyway, I, the reason I came to those juniors for the guys was that I'm like, if iron ore rallies unexpectedly, it'll take those ones up with them. What happened was the big ones went up, the little ones didn't. <laughs> So even though they were making really good money, the market just didn't chase it. Now, that was the opposite of what happened in 2021 when I did the same thing because he got some big rallies. I remember there was this little one called Strike Resources that just, it just flew up. And some of the other ones, uh, GRR went flying. Um, so there, there I was remember those ones. You look like a bit of a legend for those calls. I'll give you that. Yeah. And, and so again, so iron ore is a hobby of mine. So Anyway, at the moment, it's, it's not working. It's come down. So I'm just like, okay, let's step to the sidelines and, and we'll watch. So, But again, I just wrote about this this morning. Yara Capital have come out and said, oh, you know, once Simandu's live in 2025, it's going to flood the market and the price is going to go down. Again, we always have the issue over Chinese property, which has has been an issue since I started 12 years ago. <laughs> I, I was literally serious. In fact, then it yep. was ghost cities and then the crisis in 2015. And now they say, well, there's... It's not that they're not building it. The, the, what's holding it up is that they're, they're still completing all the undeveloped ones that the, they haven't finished kind of thing. So once that finishes, it's kind of go down. And I step back and go, well, we have two narratives here. And I don't know the answer, right? But decarbonization is incredibly steel intensive. If you're going to have all these windmills and electric cars and yada, 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 if demand's still right. And then we have India coming up and, and Southeast Asia. Now, that may not be enough to offset the retraction in Chinese demand, but the question is, do we get that retraction, which everybody assumes? Now, the reason I bring that up is there was a guy called Mark Eames. He wrote in 2021 that no country that's industrialized has kind of 
seen their steel production and demand collapse. So Britain, America, you know, and he made the point then that China is still only 60% urbanized or something. There's a long way to go. So anyway, all this is percolating around, right? And I don't know what the answer is, but I do know that uh, they're very profitable. When they run, they really do run, like the iron ore price, when it goes, so you can get a ripping trade off it. And I'm always, well, you know, contrarian kind of thing. You go, if everybody's thinking this way, is there a chance to go the other way? Now, I think for the moment, it's probably not there with iron ore, but it, it could be um, because, again, back to Squandermania, China, China rather, may have no choice but to stimulate her economy with fresh credit. And if she does, that'll pump up the commodities market in general. So there's no reason to think it won't do it for iron ore if it's going to do it for the other stuff. So I watch it with interest, so not buying at the moment, but um, I don't I don't write it off the way everybody else does. Um, that's an extremely valid point because at the end of the day, uh, China had its uh, second largest uh, iron ore imports. I think it was, was it last year in 23 or 22? Like they're still importing enormous amounts of iron ore and really it's only their steel margins that are suffering right now. They're still consuming it. Uh, and we're still getting over, you know, $110 uh, US dollars per ton. Like it's still an enormous trade. So I actually agree with you on that. That is a nice contrarian view you're taking. Uh, maybe we need to put down the typical Australian bet on what size of stimulus China will provide because I'm still not convinced China is going to put a capital injection. I'm still of the view that they're going to do these little things to make waves but not really drive a commodities boom that we've seen. Would you like to put out a forecast or, or even make a bet that I'll be wrong and you'll be right? No, because again, it's not something I, if you'd asked me this six months ago, I would have said, no, iron ore is going to go up because I can see the disconnect kind of thing. At the moment, I think it might just muddle along okay. like this. But having said that, again, I sent you the article earlier today about the investment in mining, right? We so again- get to that. That was a good one. When we talk about stimulus, that's the demand side. Then we've got the supply side, right? So it's like, well, has the iron ore industry been building- a ton of mines in the last 10 years? The answer is no, they haven't. Mm. So except for the the big one in Africa, which again, the, the bearish narrative assumes that it's going to be producing and exporting by the end of next year, which I just kind of get, well, you know, miners aren't famous for delivering on time and budget. <laughs> so, the idea that this massive project is just going to ramp up uh, straight away, I don't know, I'm a bit sceptical. Well, also too, sticking with the narrative of the um, the Brio's new mine is going to be an, uh, the Pilbara killer, it's actually ignoring the other developing economies and the other countries that are rapidly embracing electrification, like India. India, India is over 1 billion people and there is this massive urbanisation, multi-decade urbanisation underway. They're going to need steel. There is an urbanisation happening um, across Africa that's going to consume steel. And I think too much of the iron ore narrative, sometimes unfairly, gets pinned to what's China going to do next when there is huge um, undercurrents that support long-term demand for iron ore. Well, it does get back to the price. So again, the the Evergrande thing flared up in the, in the consciousness of the market in 2021. For that two years, iron ore has actually been really strong. So it, it, it begs the question, why? What? If, the prop, if that Chinese property market has been in crisis that entire time, and that's the thing that's going to take it down, well, why didn't it go down? <laughs> Like it doesn't doesn't stack up now. Okay. Bale had a bit of an accident that kind of helped. <laughs> well, well, that, that was true, true. But I would have expected the iron ore price to be weaker relative to the supposed Chinese property crisis that we're all told about constantly. Yeah, I agree. It does the one. There is one part of it that dominates the narrative. All right, now I want to shift gears for lack of a better way of knowing how to take everybody to the next segment. I want to talk about critical minerals and the article that you sent me this morning. Now. Um, look, basically, nickel, lithium and cobalt have dominated the headlines and they've attracted a lot of investment in the last couple of years. And arguably, they've sucked money out of a lot of other juniors that have got probably more viable projects. Um, but because everybody's so excited about this EV revolution and all these minerals that we're going to need, they've hogged the headlines. And yet now their prices are tanking. And some of the boring old base metals, which personally are my favourite, haven't been picking up that attention are you seeing any investor sentiment swinging towards things like aluminium, copper, tin? Not really. I do know... Like the non-exotic stuff. I, th I, do, I believe there's a bull argument for tin. Not that I, I, under I don't understand well, it. No, I love the tin argument. Um, well, copper is the interesting one to me, right? Because if you go back a year or two, everybody was bullish on copper. It was copper, 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 copper. I've been writing about copper since 2019 and the price has barely moved. Yeah, and it, it hasn't done anything. 
And so uh, long term, I understand that bull argument the most and I find that one the most appealing. But again, with the ASX, the biggest problem is, well, how do you play it? There's very few, and I'm sure other people have told you on this podcast, there's very few pure play copper producers um, where you can just sort of click your fingers and go, like I know you go, BHP, Rio, Fortescue, that's easy. Sandfire is probably the last one left. And then the some of the smaller ones have run into all sorts of trouble uh, lately. So it's the market's kind of skeptical of those projects. So I don't... I, the, the narrative of the EVs, I think, has obviously taken a battering because of what's happened with lithium and, and nickel. I don't really see yet as a copper as having a powerful pull for the general kind of investor. I think they're more caught up with what's going on with NVIDIA and US tech and all that type of thing. So I I think mining as a general rule doesn't have a grand narrative that's really exciting the the average kind of marginal investor, if you like. Does that narrative not existing for mining create opportunities for investors if they're willing to look at stuff that isn't hot and sexy? Oh, I think absolutely. Uh, I mean, I've been running for a long time. I still think we're going to get a bigger run in commodities than than we've seen so far. Probably like you, it's taking way longer than I thought. I'm <laughs> like copper. I'm having flashbacks to a meeting I had around this time last year in 2022, and I'm like, 2024 is the year. And here we are, and I'm not sure I'm going to be proven right just yet. But it is the old case. Like, you just, the miners don't invest the same way that they do. At some point, we have to run down those existing reserves, and the price has to go up to incentivize capital to come into the industry. Now, at the at the moment, everybody's running scared again. So capital is not coming towards the industry. So I think we have to get rising prices. So, but, okay, so you think rising prices is the only thing that's going to bring investors back to this Absolutely. sector? Absolutely. Right. Plus we have the, again, it gets back to the squandermania idea that the, the Western governments and China have to print money to balance their books. That's inflationary. That's good for commodities. So let's wrap up today's podcast with general commodities. As I said, you're quite agnostic to sectors of the ASX in general. You're looking for small caps that are moving or likely to move based on certain events. We've covered iron ore. Um, we've covered critical minerals and we've talked a little bit about gold. What other commodities are either on your radar as potential like opportunities that people aren't looking at right now? Uh, I don't necessarily have any others. I mean, I followed the oil market and as you know, I've followed that for a long time. Unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but it's kind of a bit of a dead zone oil. Like it's, it doesn't, in theory, it's like a good price. It's an okay price. Like 80 bucks a barrel is, is pretty good. So you get the, the cash flow, but again, Investors follow thematics and, and narratives, that type of thing, and oil just doesn't bring one with it. Um, so that's a, I follow it, but it's a dead zone. <laughs> dead zone. <laughs> In other words. I like that description of it though. <laughs> nickel, it's funny you mentioned nickel, because I'm just like, I give up on that. It's too hard. Um, although having said that, you would, arguably you'd make the case that now's, you know, the Rick Rule thing is like, you, you step in when it's in the utmost distress, <laughs> but you, ha- you have to be so patient with that type of thing, because God knows when it comes back and all that type of thing. Um, so really the ones that interest me right now are gold, got to be gold, got to be gold. Uh, and then I am, I am following lithium now because again, it's all been dumped, but really I think long-term lithium is still in play. So that's probably the one I'm most interested in. All right. So talk to me about why lithium. Now, my problem here with lithium, it's not that I'm bearish lithium in general. It's just that it had this enormous speculative rally. And when anything like that happens, you know, I'm sort of like, well, it's in a hype cycle and I naturally sort of shy away from it. Uh, also, too, I made the mistake over the weekend of doing a deep dive on hydrogen cars versus lithium cars. <laughs> Everybody, a very boring podcast on that coming your way at some point. What, what makes you interested in lithium? Because let's be honest, like China can actually control the market pricing mechanism here. Uh, but I know Australia has some excellent lithium listed companies around. So why would this company be on your radar? Because it has gone through some boom and busts in recent years. Oh, I mean, I've watched them all. So I've seen it boom and bust. So all I would say right now is that it's, I'm not saying that lithium is going to come back straight away kind of thing, but what I've found over the years, this is especially during resources, you kind of want to know what you want to go for, if this makes sense, when it does go. So we've had a bunch of lithium projects get launched. Some got there, some didn't, some are... Uh, not going to get there kind of thing. But I want to do my homework now, if that makes sense, and go, okay, well, I don't know whether lithium is going to move now, but if it moves in six to 12 months, I know exactly which ones I want to go for kind of thing, if that makes sense. So PLS is a classic. So that 
uh, so Pilbara kind of, I think it has to be the, the band leader, if you like. So it looks like it's bottom, bottoming out around this kind of $3.80 mark kind of thing. It came out with its update in, in January. The market kind of went with it. Okay, you've, you're down, but we've kind of priced it in now because it's it's been smashed around. I think we have to see that one start rising for the lith- for the juniors and the the followers to to catch a bit again. So I'm sort of following what's going on there, and of course we've got the big short interest in it. So that's of interest to me. I don't think the lithium story just stops now in 2024. Um, so it, again, with commodities, you have to the tricky part with commodities you you have to decide are you looking for momentum and that kind of short-term spike like we're getting with the uranium at the moment or are you in it for the long-term kind of thing because it can take a long time much longer than you think for some of this stuff to come into play so but as a long-term story i'm i'm still curious and interested in in where the lithium market goes and how the the car market develops because you can overlay the geopolitical stuff on it too it's like china has an EV car industry, and they want to dominate the world markets with that industry. They want to knock out Japan and all that type of thing. So that puts lithium in play long term for me. And for strate- strategically for them, they want to cut down on oil use because that's their choke point with the uh, with the military stuff. So yeah, I feel like you have to follow that. Um, also true, just to add a positive for the lithium story is lithium isn't just about EVs. That is a narrative that we've been very much caught up in, but it's all over battery storage that's really important when it yeah. comes to lithium. And we are moving to that. We just don't know what the, the the extension of that battery storage looks like. All right. Now, I wouldn't normally do this with any other guests, but you and I have got a long history, so I can do it. Let's rattle off a couple of commodities and tell me if you're interested in them or not. Uranium, interested or not? Should be, but not really. Don't know why it doesn't appeal to me. <laughs> okay. Tin. Tin, don't know a thing about it, but I do believe there's a bull argument for it. So I'm curious if you have ways to play that one. Well, there are t- like 10 listed tin explorers and that's it. Okay. They're, they're not very hard to find. Uh, there's a couple <laughs> of good ones. There's a good one in Tasmania that I won't name publicly, but there, there's not many. There's like 10 um, listed global tin explorers. So it's not hard to be in the top 10. You can okay. pick your top 10 pretty easily. Let's talk silver. What do you think of silver? I have no interest in silver. Why is that? Well, for 12 years, I've heard arguments about why silver has to go up and it's like not like gold because it's industrial and it has a use. I'm pretty sure in 12 years, silver's done, Jack. Uh, and you can't get a silver, a pure silver mine anyway. It's always a byproduct of something else. <laughs> Anyway, I just feel like it's a waste of time. I think my problem with silver is it's... I, look, I love silver. I'm actually quite I bullish. I know you love silver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I'm not one of those silver people. <laughs> just to clarify, I now feel I have to justify this. I love silver because of its role as an industrial metal. I do not believe that we're going to see some of the hype, um, crazy price forecasts that have been put forward for the silver price. Interestingly, the only companies that really put out those $100 per ounce silver prices often happen to be pure silver mines that rely on that narrative to drive them. Well, mine. it probably will. I mean, the government's printed so much money that some will go into silver. Silver's an industrial metal. I, I cannot see silver going to $100 per ounce, US okay. dollars per ounce, much to the disappointment of a couple of silver people who I'm sure no doubt will attack me on Twitter for that. Lead and zinc. How do you feel about base metals? I had a crack at a lead and zinc mine. I went broke. (laughs) It was a long time ago. Damn it. So I, again, lead and zinc, probably essential products, but I just struggle to see, uh, you know, buying a lead and zinc miner and it taking off in the same way. Because, you know, again, so much is driven by narratives and speculative interests and all that type of thing. It's very hard to see the the herd, as it were, piling into the latest zinc mine. <laughs> yeah, I've tried. I've tried to make zinc happen, and um, not everybody shares my enthusiasm. Zinc's cyclical, and it actually does well when economy uh, an economy is constructed. Yes, so- there's probably good money in it, but I don't know as a stock kind of speculator if it's gonna get me a quick win. <laughs> <laughs> not a quick win. You got to really, you know, get in the trenches and hold on to those ones. <laughs> Now, uh, I've got two more questions to round out to today. Now, in all the years that I've known you and had the pleasure of working with you and being your friend, I've found you to be very forward thinking. Now, while we are a predominantly commodities podcast, I'd like some sort of uh, forecast from you. Like, what are, what have you got a long-term line of sight on here happening in the market? You know, you called tech, certain tech stocks being a big thing years before they were happening. As I said, you've been quite forward thinking with iron ore. Do you have some sort of really contrarian view some sort of, it seems really out of place right now, but could be a possibility. 
Oh, only that um, if you're listening to this and you're you're interested in small caps or or you think you should be is what kind of is get on board. I think we've just talked about how there's been a little rally for three or four months. I think the market can run for for several years. And again, it goes back to that game plan where we go uh, with that Colin Nicholson book, stage one, stage two, stage three, right? We're, if we're in stage one, we've got a long way to get to stage three. And stage three is basically wild speculation, which is what it was in 2020. Now, I can tell you from personal experience, the difference in the market from 2020 when people were punting around like mad and stocks would fly up with basically no reason, uh, it was just ridiculous. You could throw a dart and make money in that market, right? In that market. Then you go into 2022 and 23, incredibly difficult. And one fund manager said, this is like the GFC. Like they're trading like the world's going to, to hell, right? So everything was totally crushed. And so now we're getting like a little bit of a reversion back to kind of normal. But there's going to be so much opportunity in the next couple of couple of years. And that's going to be in the mining and tech and all sorts of things. Um, so I'm super bullish. I mean, everyone drones on about, you know, recession and rates and consumer spending, blah, 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 blah. The stock market already priced all that stuff in last year, and and now it's looking for the, for for the next wave of of what's happening. So, get amongst it. Thank you for giving us the hot take for this podcast. Final question. Look, to be honest, I could probably bust out another ten questions if we had time, but I'm pretty sure you and I need to eat. Let's end today with you and I have spent numerous times at bars together, mm. but and I don't think I've ever bought you a cocktail in my life. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've only ever bought you like whatever the cheapest house beer was. Tell me, if we were at a bar later at some point in the near future, what cocktail would I be buying you? Well, I'm, I'm not a huge uh, cocktail drinker. That's probably why I've bought you cheap beer. Why is the, what's the one that James Bond drinks? I can't remember now. The martini. martini shaken, not stirred. <laughs> <laughs> That's that like do. the basic. I've never tried drinks. one of those, so that'll do. Never tried one? Ah. Really? Yeah, look, not a fan. They're quite bitter. Like Tell you need, what? you can't have, like I've got a sugary palate, a very sweet palate. I had a mojito for the first time the other week. Yeah. what do you think? Uh, salty it was and minty. lemony and salty oh, and minty they're normally minty give, give me a beer any of it yeah <laughs> see this is why I love drinking with you Callum this has been awesome it's actually been a lot of fun uh, I'd love to check in with you in another six months uh, for everybody Absolutely. listening before we let Callum go uh, I will have to say I did get a sneak peek at your buy list uh, it's your stock recommendations to your subscribers prior to today's conversation and I have to say it looks surprisingly healthy compared to how the market perceives small caps. So before we go, can you tell everybody where they can find you? Yes, uh, Fat Tail Investment Research. So you can sign up to our free e-letter if you like. That's uh, Fat Tail Daily. Um, or as I say, I have the paid product, which is Australian Small Cap Investigator, where we look at the, the long-term docs with a one to three-year time frame. Um, it's, it's not expensive. It's only 100 bucks, I think, to sign up uh, for the first 12 months. Um, it's the equivalent of five top cocktails, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. So, and as I say, like the, you're saying, the, the buy list looks good, but again, that's a function of how cheap everything has become or was at least last year. And I'm just able to pick up and go, oh, look, this this looks pretty exciting, you know. And across so many things, now I get it, I get it wrong. I don't want to make it sound like I get them all right, but there's just a heap of opportunity out there. And again, the whole risk off phase that we've we've been through that now for the last two years, that's that's turning. And there's lots of reasons to get excited for the stock market. It's going to be volatile. It always is. There's always risk, that type of thing. But there's, um, I think there's a really exciting period coming up for the next two to three years. All right. At the risk of me turning this into a John Farnham tour, because I've said goodbye that many times, <laughs> we will say goodbye for the final time today. Callum, absolute pleasure. Hope to have you on again in six months, which I've already said before, but I want to repeat it because this, fun. this was Anytime. fun. Maybe next time we'll do it with an actual cocktail. Sure. You can, have a, you can have a martini <laughs> and we'll video his face. All right. Cheers. This has been Ace. Ciao. Now, my favorite part of the podcast, it is over to you. Tell me, has listening to Callum changed your view on the market? And perhaps is everything not as bad as some of the headlines make it out to be? Do you agree that iron ore could be ready for its next run? That gold stocks might be looking pretty cheap? And how do you feel about uranium? And are you also looking for a tin company? Let's keep this conversation going. We can chat over at Twitter. My handle is Shay A. Russell. We can talk on YouTube or you can leave a comment where you listen to this podcast. As always, don't go without hitting the follow button so you always know what stocks are making news, which commodities are moving markets and the companies trying to get them out of the ground.